to call the meeting of the Finance Committee to order. Um, I'd like to start with one thing that I, uh, I should have done in December, but with all the hectic thing, I forgot about it. And that's just like, uh, as you know, last fall we lost one of our longest standing members of the Finance Committee, Kenny Sims. And uh, he had been on the Finance Committee since the 70s. And uh, we had four people who were serving on the Finance Committee over the last few years from the 70s. Uh, Mary Ronan, as you know, passed away last year, or the year before. Uh, Ken Simmons and Dick and I. Uh, so Ken had been on for an awfully long time, and you know, I didn't realize half the stuff he did until I, I read his uh, obituary. So I'd like to just ask for a moment of silence for, for Ken. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, what we want to finish tonight is uh, reviewing the rest of the articles on the Finance Committee. So uh, we got the report handed out, or the proposed report. Uh, it's four pages. I originally had six pages, uh, you know, with the title page and the members and all that. And then I decided to have a two-page introduction to a six-page FinCom report. It was sort of silly and a waste of about 250, 300 pieces of paper. So. Uh, I, I zap the front two. Um, so the prime focus is going to be on articles two, three, and four, and those are the uh, school uh, renovations. Um, <coughs> articles five, six, we have already voted, uh, and eight we voted. I want to revote seven, uh, but we'll get to that a little bit later. So the prime focus right now. Uh, is articles uh, two and three. Now both of these articles deal with the uh, Stratton School. Uh, and the moderator has already decided that we will, uh, we will, we will put them be both before the town meeting and they'll both be discussed together. Um, but then we'll go back and vote on each one separately. So. Right now, I'd like to uh, put both articles two and three uh, before the Finance Committee. Uh, the amounts are all underlined, because obviously we haven't voted on these. Uh, both of these motions have changed about five times in the last two days uh, <coughs> as information became available. Uh, article two is sort of separated because uh, we have the bids in for article two, so that can get going sort of immediately. Uh, these are the modulars, and then Article 3, that's still going to go out to bid. So with that, I'd like to uh, turn the floor over to, uh, Charlie, who would you like to begin with this? Yeah. Okay, Kathy, would you like to sort of give an overview to the Finance Committee about how this all took place? Just a minute or so. Just a minute. Uh, from which point on? Is there, uh, uh, well, what's happening with the Stratton School and, and uh, how it's going to take Oh, all right. Well, it actually began before the Parents Committee. Um, <coughs> when Alan Brown was principal of Stratton School, uh, there were a number of projects that needed to be completed, and I know that you were very much a part of that in terms of um, voting and supporting different, uh, uh, two different phases for updates to Stratton. But clearly that was not entirely um, all that Stratton has needed over the years. Stratton is the last of our seven elementary schools to either be rebuilt or updated. And I know that there is a strong commitment in the community that that will happen. Um, a parent committee was established <coughs> uh, a couple of years ago. And that committee looked into um, what it would take to bring Stratton Elementary to parity with all of the other <coughs> elementary schools. Um, the committee went around to the other elementary schools, looked at floor plans, looked at um, all of the different features of the, the different schools. Parents met at, at Stratton and also gave their input. Um, we, the, the, this was discussed at school committee and the facility subcommittee and the school committee at large. And we were able to, um, compile a picture of all of that was necessary 
for Stratton to be brought to parity with the other schools. Essentially, um, some of the central core spaces needed serious updating. For example, the nurse's office and uh, the library. The library was about half the size that it needed to be to be parity and also to be uh, adequate for the school population there. Um, the other issue was just uh, the food service. I, I don't know how many of you have ever seen the kitchen um, at uh, Stratton. It's about the size of a walk-in closet. And the food was served in the corridor to students and they would take their food into the cafeteria. So they've never had a, a, a similar kind of um, kitchen that all of the other elementary schools have had. So, so in, in the design of what um, Stratton needed, in addition to just doing a reconfiguration of the space, we also needed to be able to bring all this, the other systems that had um, not been done in the last two phases. The focus of the first two phases of the, re of the renovation was in the classroom wing. And at that time, we did uh, the roof, we did wi wiring, the, the HVA system, and, and very importantly, the windows. Uh, that was um, a serious need. And so now the other part, which at one point we thought, well, maybe this would be completely rebuilt, that the other part, which is the central space of the principal's office, the nursing, food, all that is going to be updated and renovated, and the systems that involve the the kindergarten, because the kindergarten in that part of the school, as well as the gym and the cafeteria, are going to be updated in this project. So when we complete it, um, I can I believe with great confidence that Stratton will be a parity with the other elementary schools, and and it will be a very beautiful and functional school. So, so that's basically a little bit where we are uh, with this. Um, do you want any history on where we are with the modulars? Uh, I, I don't. D basically, it's what we're, we're, <coughs> we're dealing with with the construction of the school. So we would appreciate your support, the, certainly the community of Stratton, as well as um, the school department, in moving forward with this, with this project. It took several years to plan, and uh, we're hoping that we'll be able to begin construction um, this summer. Thank you. Okay. Charlie? Okay. Do I have any hold questions until all the presentations made, and then, and then any questions at that time? Thank you, Alan. <coughs> I've passed out a, a draft, of, I hope it's the final draft, of the uh, Capital Planning Committee report. Uh, I have not been quite as economical with paper. I noticed there's a couple of extra sheets that got printed here. I was doing pretty well until about um, 5 o'clock tonight when the first printing of this, uh, when the custodian came into my office, knocked over a cup of coffee over <laughs> my iPad, all these papers, and said, <laughs> start over. So anyway, we got it done. Um, so uh, as Dr. Bodie said, <coughs> this is the last of the seven elementary schools. And um, <coughs> the, I guess uh, the, the focus of the capital uh, planning report is really on the Stratton 2, what we call the Stratton 2 project. There was a Stratton 1 project a couple of years ago that did the work that Dr. Bodie just described. Uh, <coughs> and the Capital Planning Committee felt that um, it was important to, because of the size of the project, the amount of money we we're spending, and the fact that some of it is going to be funded by exempt um, debt under the 2000 rebuild campaign, to actually uh, determine how we stand with respect to the original equipment to voters to finish uh, the, the, the uh, second four of the seven schools uh, on, a, on an original budget of 34.5 million. And um, so if you look at the ta at, uh, table one in the report, you'll see the, uh, the original 34.5 million, which was a number uh, actually created by Al Tosti and myself uh, the original number that the school department gave us was even lower than that, uh, but we we thought we were putting enough cushion in there to cover it. But I, I, as time went on, it looked like uh, we were a little bit risk, at risk there. In any event, um, the, the, the one column there shows the uh, price of the 34.5 million rebuild uh, debt exclusion as, it, as it's affected by inflation over the uh, the 16 years since it was passed in 2000, and the inflation numbers that we use 
and, and this whole analysis follows the guidelines set forth by the DOR in how you treat uh, debt exclusions over time. So uh, there's a lot of rigorous analysis under this that's not shown in this abbreviated report. <clears throat> so the actual uh, expenditures versus time are in those little boxes um, in the, um, as you move to the right of the chart. And uh, then on the right-hand side, uh, you see the, um, the, the actual construction cost in nominal dollars and then the construction cost in, in, in $2,000. So if you, if you look at it in terms of $2,000, we spent $42 million instead of $34.5 million. In, the, in, the, in terms of $2,000. So at face value, this has exceeded the, the cost that the voters were told they'd be paying to increase their taxes. However, um, uh, there's a couple of mitigating factors. Um, and first, and one of the reasons, I should say the reason that this took so long was you may recall that SBAB, School, School Building Assistance Board, <coughs> froze all reimbursements in the uh, early 2000s, and then it went out of business, and then the MSBA came in, so there was a three or four year hiatus there where actually nothing happened, okay? You see that gap in the, in the middle between the, the Dallin and the Thompson, that was actually about seven years. So <clears throat> along the way, um, we also learned from the MSBA that they were not going to reimburse the uh, cost of the uh, Stratton, or re help renovate the Stratton, so that cost had to be borne entirely by the town in its non-exempt budget. So um, what, what we did, when I say we here, I'm referring to the Finance Committee, the Capital Planning Committee, and Town Meeting, and the Town Manager, is in financing the Thompson, we uh, didn't put it all basically into the debt exclusion. We funded some of it from the debt exclusion, we sold the Crosby School, and took the, re the revenue from that asset sale, and we also took funds from the normal non-exempt capital budget put them all together in a pool to pay for the $20 million of the uh, Thompson School. And we've taken a similar approach to the uh, funding of the Stratton. But in this case, there's absolutely no reimbursement. We did get 48 or 50 percent reimbursement on the Thompson. So um, the, the actual debt excluded impact, tax increase impact uh, on the, on the um, uh, taxpayers has been reduced over this 16-year uh, period by by Arlington funding some of the schools in with non-exempt money and with asset sales and grants and things like that that reduce the exempt impact. So the chart on Figure One, the cumulative exempt debt impact, actual versus anticipated, shows the uh, cost over time. Um, and the, the, uh, the blue line is the actual cost in $2,000, you know, uh, inflation adjusted $2,000. And the red line is what was anticipated at the time, considering that the first two schools were supposed to get 63% re uh, reimbursement, and the second two were going to get 50%. As it turned out, um, the Stratton didn't get any. But we still have stayed within the, uh, within the limits uh, on an inflation adjusted basis of the original uh, debt exclusion. Then, um, I think, uh, <clears throat> you know, Kathy, had, uh, I, I don't think, I mean, she was, uh, she, she, she could have been a little bit more uh, forceful. I, can, I can't say enough about the way the school department, in particular Dr. Bodie, led the, the, the uh, Stratton parents through a planning process, an evaluation process, to come up with what were reasonable and necessary uh, changes to bring uh, the Stratton School uh, up to parity with uh, with the other schools that had been <coughs> completed. And I think, if my memory serves me right, this was a 12 or 18 month process, a lot of meetings, they had architects and, and uh, technical uh, support, but they came up with a good plan. And when we went to town meeting last year, we were anticipating that it was going to cost um, 10 to 11 and a half million dollars. There was a little bit of a, um, you know, uncertainty there. So it turned out that the cost of the modulars at the, um, at the Stratton that have to be put in for the students to live in, uh, to, to uh, uh, be educated in during the construction period, uh, came out, went, rose from $1.8 million to uh, $3.1 million. And that's something we learned about two days ago. It's one of the reasons why, as Al said, you know, the numbers have been moving around this week. And then, <coughs> uh, 
Most recently today, uh, the town manager <coughs> advised us that the architect and the um, uh, project, the uh, owner's project manager, the OPM, independently <coughs> came up with, with cost estimates based on the architectural drawings and current prices in the marketplace, et cetera. And we uh, have learned that there's a very high probability of uh, another increase of about 1.7 million. So both of these increases are reflected in the, the 15.793 million that you see at the top of page, uh, table, table two on page four. So what I'm gonna address now is how, uh, how, we're, how this is gonna be paid for. So <clears throat> we have in the non-exempt capital plan that's gonna go before uh, town, town meeting in, uh, in April, about $6.3 million of borrowing that's going to be funded through the non-exempt debt service. Last year, uh, town meeting voted to support an initial uh, $1,085,000 to do the architectural plans and, and move the project forward. We also, uh, so the total non-exempt debt here uh, that's going to be carried on the project is, right, is currently estimated at $7.4 million. And I want to caution that, um, as Al said, we're, we're, there's new information constantly coming in. We're hopeful that these, this is a conservative number, but you can never tell th in today's environment. We have uh, <clears throat> the ability to apply what we in the Capital Planning Committee refer to as a, a, a capital carry forward. And these are uh, unexpended funds on prior projects that can be um, repurposed, if you will, uh, under the law and with vote of town meeting to another project, provided that the, re the uh, the funds are in the same category. You can't, you can't take, um, if, some, if you borrow money for a fire truck and it comes in less than the anticipated price, you can use that money for another piece of rolling stock like a, a public works truck or something like that, but you can't use it for a building because that's in a different uh, bonding category. So uh, the funds here come from um, uh, about a million of it, a million, about 1.1 million comes from the uh, Thompson School Project. Um, and then about 500,000, a little bit more than that, comes from um, the uh, community safety building, which, which looks like it's coming in, uh, this last phase is coming in under budget substantially. So we'll have those funds available to apply to the strap. So, <clears throat> so the total non-exempt debt and capital carry forward contribution is $9 million. That means that we, we need to exempt about $6.7 million. In addition, the town owns an asset in uh, East Arlington on Mass Avenue. Its uh, address is 1207 Mass Avenue. The Board of Selectmen uh, determined uh, that they will sell that building uh, at, at some point in the not too distant future. It's currently being used for some, um, some activities uh, designed or, or appropriated by the Board of Selectmen, but it eventually will be sold, and we're anticipating it'll, it should bring in something on the order of a million dollars. So that million dollars can be used to reduce the exempt debt burden from 6.7 to 5.7 uh, million dollars. So that's the background of how this is going to be financed. Uh, there are two articles in the <coughs> excuse me. There are two, two articles in the, in the warrant. One is Article Two, which is to award uh, to appropriate funds for um, the modulars that have to be. Uh, put in for the students to use during the construction period. This is the, uh, we, we originally put this in, in the warrant because um, that money really has to be spent first. If that money can't be spent right away, the project is never gonna start in September. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, that number in, in the recent quotations rose from an earlier estimate of about 1.8 million to 3.1 million dollars. Part of the reason for this is that uh, Arlington is not alone in its uh, feeling the effects of, of student population growth, and there's a tremendous demand for modulars in, in uh, eastern Massachusetts communities right now, and the vendors are, you know, they're feeling pretty independent because their sales are pretty good. So, um, so Article 2 is, is to borrow money, or, uh, allow the treasurer to borrow money to fund these modulars uh, at $3.1 million. Um, is, it, is it borrowing or is it? No, it's farm. Yeah. And then um, the, uh, the, the, the total project is 15.793 million. 
We've already appropriated, not under article th the table in Article 3, we've already appropriated a million eighty five. <clears throat> we're also we're also appropriating this three point one million in the prior article. So there's a net requirement to appropriate another eleven point six million. Uh, one point six million of that, as I mentioned just a few seconds ago, is going to be funded by transfers from other projects, and the balance is going to be funded by uh, by debt, which is a total of nine point nine six million, um, and uh, about about three point two of that should be. That, if that's right, should be non -exempt, should be exempt. I'm sorry, 3.2 that should be non-exempt, and 6.7 should be exempt, and that 6.7 will eventually be reduced by the million-dollar asset sale. Sorry to be so fast on that. I hope, I'm not trying to move the shells around here, but just trying to describe uh, how we're <coughs> approaching this. So, <coughs> um, I guess the. Uh, uh, you know, I, I just want to emphasize one thing to the Finance Committee, and I'm going to emphasize the same thing to the, to the town meeting, when we were at town meeting. And that is that uh, that figure one, the cumulative exempt debt impact, actual versus anticipated, says that the town of Arlington uh, met its commitment to, to the taxpayers even over an extended 16-year period. First of all, in getting all of the schools renovated, even in the absence of support on the stratton from the MSBA. And secondly, keeping the, <coughs> keeping the exempt expenditures uh, after an adjustment for inflation on the, you know, in, in the same um, range, very close to what the original estimates of what that tax impact would be to, to the taxpayers. And I think if, if, the, if the town is going to act, if <coughs> it's going to ask taxpayers to fund, um, you know, middle school, high school improvements, et cetera, it's, it's an important message to, to uh, send to them that, you know their their vote and their their uh, desires both for uh, assets and capacity as well as their desire to uh, control their taxes uh, are taken very seriously by the town. So um, this actually brings the, to a close the elementary school rebuild program that's actually started in 1991. You may remember the first uh, project that we undertook was the building of the rebuilding of the, uh, renovating of the Otteson uh, Junior High School, or middle school. Actually, at that time, we were converting it from a junior high school to a middle school. And then, uh, in 1998, there was another debt exclusion. We did the first three schools of the remaining seven, and then in 2000, the, the second debt exclusion. And I, it, the total expenditures to date under that program have been uh, 98.8 million, just under $100 million. So, uh, with those comments, um, be happy to answer any questions, but uh, we, I ask that the Finance Committee support Articles 2 and 3. Okay. Um, Adam, do you have anything to add? Yeah, very well. Okay, great. Okay, uh, I'd like to open it up for any questions uh, or discussion for the, for the uh, Finance Committee. Okay. Is there any, uh, yeah, just uh, curious of um, how you look into and how you decide between a permanent construction and a modular classroom, and if there's any, any savings uh, one way or the other, short term and longer term? <clears throat> well, that, that question actually is apropos of Article 4, or 4, 4 or 5, whatever the next four. article is. Um, but um, with respect to the, um, to the Stratton, uh, the choice it, it isn't putting something permanent there. I mean, the, these are there because the school's going to be torn apart and renovated, and the students have to go someplace. And a, as you know, with the uh, discussions about um, the, the pressure on enrollment, there there isn't a lot of space in the other uh, school buildings to to actually move these children around. So uh, it's a necessity to get this done. We suggested classrooms outside, but <laughs> <laughs> that school could be tense. You know, you know, and, uh, fought that. Um, Dean? All right, I have a few questions. I'll try to go through them quickly. So, Charlie, on the $6.7 million of exempt debt, or maybe on the total, total project, if we got into a situation where the project costs continued to rise a million dollars. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't quite hear you. I changed my question. So, if we got to a point where the um, project budget continued to rise above the current estimate, or we got to a point of, um, you know, the, the sale of the DAV doesn't materialize or whatever. Would the Capital Planning Committee be looking, and you had to come up with another additional ways to fund this, would we be heading towards the exempt 
side of the capital budget no, or I, we have to the non exempt This has to be approved by the DOR. I don't think we get approval to increase the uh, exempt amount. I mean, they, they, they will have to evaluate this to determine how far their rules uh, apply, okay? But, I, I mean, th there might be a $500,000 to a million dollars worth of, uh, let me call it flexibility, based, based on <clears throat> whatever their, uh, however they assess the, the whole library of rules and regulations they have concerning this. I mean, we've taken this approach because that's just right. one way to analyze it. For example. So if I looked at like can, that. Can I just. Yeah, finish? yeah. For example, uh, we completely ignored the question of interest. And, and the DOR allows you to exempt interest in addition to the capital. Okay. The reason why we ignored the question of interest was because the SBAB approached the first two schools in an entirely different funding way than the MSBA approached the second two. And the analysis just became so complicated that the, it was simpler to just do this analysis. But if you folded the interest in, okay, right. then we are probably way under what was originally anticipated. Because, because the interest costs actually turned out to be, in practice, much lower than they were in 2000. Right. So, and so if I look at it, though, you, and gleaning from part of what you said, if I focus back on the six, seven million of debt, exempt debt required, you have, yeah. you have effectively two, I'm gonna call them cushions, just in case we have some overruns. One would be the you sell, sale of the building, which brings us down to five, seven, and the other one is the sort of half million to a million dollar. Squishiness. Yeah. So we wouldn't end up in a problem if the cost went up a little more yeah, that's than we're right. expecting. That's, that would be my guess. But if it goes up a lot more, or if it, if it turns out that the DOR turns around and says, well, you, you can't do five or six million, you can only do three million, which I, I'm not expecting, but I'm just saying as a what if, um, we would have to take the cost out of the uh, non exempt capital budget. And that means that okay. uh, you'd have to turn around and look at what other projects that are in there, and they would either have to be cut or postponed. Um, okay. And you know, there's a five-year queue of people waiting to get their projects taken care of. Okay. And then when you, when we get to the spring, I'm assuming because I think I, I gleaned in here that you have the words 2017 in here. So when you do the, when the capital planning report comes out in the spring, and you do your five percent rec reconciliation for revenues, this is reduced. <coughs> this goes into that calculation. And this is absolutely all of these numbers are in the in the capital plan in the spring. For 17. Right. Okay. We, we won't appropriate them because they will already have been appropriated, but they will be they will be uh, calculated in the capital budget. All right. So we had, if my, my th third question is, um, and Dr. Bodie might better to answer this one, but um, when you gave your presentation at um, town meeting, I think it was the second night of the spring, town meeting, you accelerated, we moved the capital budget forward. There was a Stratton parent who spoke, and she was not particularly happy with the modular arrangement that was on the table at the moment. Um, are they okay now? Are they not happy? I'm sorry. Uh, I, if you remember, there was a Stratton parent that got up, and, they, and, and she had indicated that the modulars were at the time going to be, I thought she said at the Odyssey. Oh, the, the parent from the Stratton. Yes. Right. Okay, my mind was focused on the yep. Yeah. Uh, these, these modulars are going to be located at the Stratton. Uh, actually, Dr. Bodie can answer that. Um, I believe they are. The short answer to your question. Historically, they're the, happier. much happier. Okay. The, the whole community can be together. They'll be. Um, it will. It will be certainly not without its issues um, next year. But the original plan was to have the 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 school divided into at least three different uh, campuses. Um, the biggest objection was having the fourth and fifth grade at the middle school, the fourth grade in particular. But as we went through the process, it became very clear this summer that to do that kind of dislocation in three different places could end up um, making it more difficult to make other decisions that were important to make about um, <coughs> how we're going to deal with enrollment growth. So we went back to the to the single, the single um, campus for all the modulars. And now, in hindsight, it probably ended up being a good decision because given the way the modular uh, classroom costs have increased uh, and most of the costs are in site, site development uh, and building the, the modulars, we probably are saving money by doing it this way. Okay, got it. And then, Charlie, my last 
question that will round this out is um, between the various boards in town, the capital planning committee, permanent town building committee, um, in the school administration, the town manager, whoever, right? Um, as we look at the size of this school when it opens and then projected enrollment and, and things like that, is there anybody who's saying right now that this school is too small and that we need a bigger school? Because I, I assume in other parts of town to start hearing- to the Stratton. Right, the Stratton. Is anybody raising their hand because- just, Saying that the school is too small? Right, we should be building a bigger Stratton because this cannot hold some surging enrollment that everybody but apparently us knows about. Uh, I haven't heard anybody say that to me. School committee opposed? I have not heard anything along those lines either. In fact, uh, when Stratton is completed, we will have three classrooms that could be repurposed. They, they'll be used, but they could be repurposed for additional classrooms. In fact, there, there was a um, request from the, the school enrollment task force to, to look at the possibility of doing a redistricting of the town to utilize those three classrooms. So, so, so the answer is we would have still capacity there. And also, when we looked at the enrollment growth numbers for the town <coughs> and the most recent ones in December, we're not seeing any growth uh, at Stratton. It's quite minimal, 20, 20 students. Um, and in fact, two of our west side schools down in Bracket will probably decrease somewhat, a little bit, in enrollment. Um, our growth over the next five to 10 years will be on the east side of Arlington. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Dr. Bodie, now the, um, you're basically leaving the number of classrooms that are set up in the wing, the classroom wing is basically staying the same with some renovations. Um, how many kindergarten classes do you have on the other side and how many uh, will you have after the finish? We have three and we'll have three. Those rooms will be renovated because each of the classrooms has um, a bathroom that all, all th three of them need to be renovated. Most kindergarten classrooms have bathrooms and suite. As far as the classroom wing, there is not gonna be any changes other than some little cosmetic. We did, we did a lot of the wiring and the windows, the HVA system in the, in the first two phases. Um, what will change in the, that wing is if, it, if anybody's been in Stratton, you know at the far end of the classroom wing there is a, um, it was a gym, it was a, they had, Stratton had two gyms and uh, it's had multiple <coughs> uses over the years. But this is going to be the site of the library. And uh, so th that area where the library is currently will be, ex that area will be it additive to the nurses area. We'll, f f we'll have a conference room for the first time. Um, and then there will be the expansion of the kitchen that will be a, a serving kitchen, be a warming kitchen like all of our other elementary <coughs> schools. As you know, the central kitchen for the elementary schools is Thompson. So ba basically that's the change. I can talk about other ones that might be happening. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, John. Yeah, Charlie, um, you said that uh, you thought that DOR would eventually... I'm sorry? DOR would eventually agree with this approach and, and find that there's already authorization for at least uh, 6.7 million. We, we, think, we, we think that uh, there are a couple of uh, ways to come to the same conclusion. So we don't think that we're far off. Um, my question is, how does that process work? When, when do you approach them? You know, when, when are they gonna rule on this? And actually, uh, I think uh, Rich Fisay, Biscay, the uh, town comptroller, and uh, Adam Chaplain and uh, Brian Berry for the Capital Planning Committee are scheduled to meet with them in the next couple of days. Okay. So it's not a, I mean, I don't know if it'll happen this week or next week, but it's, uh, I mean, I think, the, let's put it this way, the, the level of communication between Arlington and the DOR is pretty good. Thank you. And also the, the wording has been passed by Bond Council, um, and uh, so it's, it's, it's been hammered at. Other questions? Paul? <coughs> How many classrooms, modular classrooms is it, and when does the project finish? Um, I think it's 38 modular classrooms. 
28. Uh, 28. Uh, and uh, it's supposed to, the, the students are supposed to be back uh, in the school in the fall of uh, 2017. Yeah. <coughs> there, were, we, there was a there were there were three plans that the school department during this long planning phase came up with. Uh, some of them had as long as a you know five year build out term, and I, I think the general conclusion of the school department and capital planning committee, everybody was to get it done as quickly as possible to contain the cost and minimize the disruption, the academic disruption. Okay, are there any other questions uh, from the Finance Committee on Articles 2 and 3? Okay, then let's uh, take a look. Article 2 is for uh, 3.1 million for borrowing uh, for the modular classrooms. Uh, those bids are in. Uh, so, so that's 100% firm without a. Uh, what is the will of the committee? Second. Second. Okay, favorable actions were moved and seconded. Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor of authorizing a borrowing of $3.1 million, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, favorable action. Okay, Articles 3, again, we're looking at a total project of $11.608 million plus the $3.1 million, which you just authorized, plus the million dollars, 085, that was authorized last year. Uh, so that's the project. We're going to take clean out accounts uh, for $28,959 and $1,113,773. The reason those are exact is those basically clean out those accounts. So uh, uh, the controller was always very happy to clean out accounts. Uh, and then the uh, 499 uh, is coming from uh, leftover funds uh, in the police re renovation project. Uh, that will leave a borrowing of $9,966,000. Uh, do I have a motion? So okay. moved. Second. Okay, is there any discussion? Okay, all those in favor of the uh, Article 3 vote as delineated um, in the uh, proposed finance committee report, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, favorable action, unanimous. Okay, that, uh, now let's take the Article 4. Now, this has been sort of reworded about five times today. <laughs> uh, we were originally hoping, uh, well, actually, let's separate this out into two things. Let's go into policy first, and then go into the uh, into the proposed financing. So, uh, Adam, you were the chair of the task enrollment task force. So, would you like? Could you give an overview, please? Sure. Hi, good evening everybody. Uh, so very briefly, the School Enrollment Task Force met a number of times over the course of the end of 2015, uh, and I believe now twice in, uh, twice? Once? Once in 2016, uh, looking at a, a number of the enrollment issues in the district, uh, but focusing on a recommendation for this special town meeting in terms of the capacity issues facing the Thompson Elementary School next school year. Uh, what that resulted in was the recommendation of pursuing the acquisition of two modular classrooms to go to Thompson School for September of 2016. Uh, so that policy decision was recommended by the Enrollment Task Force uh, for funding. Uh, and then as uh, Chair Tosti alluded to, there's been a number of uh, discussions back and forth about how we would uh, actually proceed with funding that. Do you want me to transition into that or do you want to? Um, sure. Uh, so initially we had talked about taking funding from um, what had been identified as surplus from the community safety building uh, project that is, as you've seen, now being utilized <coughs> to balance the, the Stratton uh, project. Uh, as this whole week has evolved and the Stratton uh, budget has been stressed by uh, increasing estimates, uh, we discussed today um, a scenario whereby we would move 
that surplus as to where you've seen it uh, in the Stratton budget, and that we would pursue an alternative funding strategy for acquiring or leasing two modular classrooms at the Thompson for next year. So the recommendation that the chairman has put before you is that for this fiscal year, uh, we would come back to this finance committee with an operating reserve fund transfer request to go to the school's operating budget uh, to be able to actually uh, pay the fixed fee associated with ordering two modular classrooms. Uh, and then any future lease fees that would be associated with those classrooms, whether we kept them for one, two, or three years, we would budget uh, either at this uh, spring's town meeting or in subsequent town meetings in future years to be able to pay those lease costs. So um, we don't have a cost in hand tonight. The first thing that we're doing is asking um, our architect who's working with the modular vendor for Stratton School uh, to see if they can quote uh, adding on uh, ordering two more modulars that could be placed at Thompson. If we get that quote, we will base what we ask the Finance Committee for and transfer uh, based on that quote. If that quote's not satisfactory, we'll go through a bid process uh, and then ask for a transfer based on that. Uh, in terms of what the chairman's put before you, uh, would be acknowledging town meeting's role in endorsing this policy and putting a resolution before them uh, endorsing this approach to acquire or lease two uh, temporary modulars at Thompson for fall of 2016. I, I think the, uh, the estimates are sort of looking at now for the modulars for three years is probably someplace between four and six hundred thousand um, dollars. I guess the, uh, the the modular market uh, has uh, uh, apparently skyrocketed a bit on, on that. So uh, we would probably, and this depends on the bids, uh, come back to the finance committee uh, sometime in February uh, and look for a transfer of something around. 200, 200 $250,000. Uh, now, uh, we have a, a million dollars in the reserve fund. Uh, we have not had any transfer requests so far. Uh, and it, it, it seems at this point that we've got the flexibility to do that. Um, the, uh, and we're, even though this is strictly a, a finance committee decision, uh, the article is before town meeting. And uh, because it's before town meeting, uh, I'd like to ask them, you know, to support that recommendation um, and not just pull it away and, and say finance committee is going to decide this. So we're looking for, finance, for town meetings uh, support um, and uh, I hope we get it. So that's, that's the recommendation that goes in there. Um, the enrollment task force work is not done. Uh, we have to, um, over the next couple of months, the other side of the issue is looking at the uh, middle school. Uh, the enrollment there also is growing, uh, and therefore we're going to have to look at various options uh, on what we're going to do on that. Part of it might involve the renovation of the high school, uh, which we will find out, I guess, in the next week or so, whether that's on the table. and. Uh, and then part of that could involve the middle, uh, the uh, Gibbs, which uh, uh, has all kinds of both positive and negative uh, ramifications. Uh, and so the enrollment task force is going to devote the next couple of months to that issue. Uh, in addition, uh, we're going to look at the, uh, the enrollment task force, uh, look at the numbers from next October 1st. Uh, as you're probably aware, this year, um, the projections uh, for, um, by the consultant who was hired to project the enrollment for the next 10 years, uh, the projections were for 184 increase in students. The actual increase was about 84. So it was 100 students off. The consultant has come back in and updated his projections. Uh, but before we undertake another uh, significant renovation at an elementary school, uh, we want to see how those numbers come out. Uh, so there could be uh, a chance that we'd be looking for permanent additions, uh, primarily, probably prom uh, at, the, uh, at the Thompson, uh, but want to see more data for that uh, before we start spending that kind of money. Uh, so that's where the enrollment task force is. Uh, the school department has, uh, will continue to look at the districts and the assignment of students. Um, we wouldn't have to do this all except 
you know, the spare classrooms are all in the western part of the town and the demand is all in the eastern part of the town. Uh, so the enrollment task force asked the school department to come back and look at redistricting and look at busing. Uh, they provided the enrollment task force with a great deal of information on both pros and cons. Uh, and this was the unanimous recommendation though uh, of the task force was to go with modulars down at the Thompson to keep the Thompson School community together. Uh, the class that would have been bused to Pierce would have been the fifth grade class, which has already spent two years being bused to the Stratton. So uh, there was some, uh, I think, feelings that, that that would have been too much. Um, uh, so that's the recommendation of the Enrollment Task Force. And uh, I'll open up uh, any other input from uh, Dr. Vody or Adam or Charlie, um, who's there. I'll open it up for questions. John? Uh, this is just a suggestion on my part. Uh, whoever presents Article 4, if it's you, uh, for instance, speaking for the Finance Committee on Article 4, I think it's a, it's a good opportunity to, to explain uh, kind of uh, a justification for the rationale by which we sort of increased <coughs> the reserve fund recently. I think this is a prime example of why it's good to have the amount of money that we do have in the reserve fund. Uh, and, and also to point out that finance, uh, the town is not vo voting the money directly. That this is essentially a, 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 a their um, a sign of the seal of approval, if you like, on our suggestion that the money come out of the, of the reserve fund. So okay. I think it would be good if you explain a little. Some, some people I don't, in town don't even understand very much about the reserve fund. So I think it's a good opportunity to talk about. The, the process that we've undergone recently in increasing the zero fund. That's a good idea. I think we haven't really worked out the presentation. I would assume that the town manager would make it since he was the chair of the enrollment <laughs> task force, but we started uh, and get input. So thank you. Uh, Dean? So I guess I, have, I guess I have a question for the chair. Um, so you had talked about we're going to add two modulars so they have a, additional space, but you didn't sort of touch on how long you thought that was gonna, if that was gonna work for next year and how long it was gonna last. So do you think that gets us three years of breathing room, five years, 10 years at the Thompson? How long is two modulars getting us? I, I either, I'm okay with either. <laughs> um, two, next year, that's, what, that will, that's probably what it will get us. The issue is that um, we have, we've had three classes, third, fourth, and fifth grade, that have been um, two classes, two, two classrooms for that grade. Oh, I have a handout that's gonna show all that part. Oh, you have all <laughs> Yes, don't worry. Okay, so next year, yes, we, assuming that we're gonna have four kindergartens and we have a, a fifth grade exiting that has two classrooms, we're going to need <coughs> we're going to need additional two, and that's what this is addressing. But next, next year's 16, 17, fifth grade is also two. And so they, when they exit, we'll probably also need um, two more at that point. So there are decision points uh, that we have, there are decisions along the way. The task force is going to address those and make some recommendations as we go forward. But as the, the, as the chair has said, I think there's some members that would like to see what the, the actual numbers are um, at Thompson over this, the next registration period. Well, right. But I do think, I, I think the one thing I was trying to get at to make sure everyone, whether they were at the task force or not, understands is this is not fixing the Thompson. This is not fixed to Thompson. This, this band-aids the enrollment growth at Thompson next year. Okay. But the modulars themselves could be for three, we're looking at possibly three years of just being there. The modulars could be there for yeah. three years. Um, the, the two modulars would be, will be sited on the parking lot. And having looked at the dimensions of the parking lot and the dimensions of modular classrooms, um, without going on to the public sidewalk, I think we can only get two modulars on that site. Three would, I don't think we have the length or the width to do three. So the, there'll be other issues involved in actually the siting of these modulars as we go forward. 
So that was going to be my next question, actually. It's a question I really don't understand, want to know is, so we put two modules there. We vote to put two modules there. And then we start to realize that we have to put, we have to do something, like let's say an addition on to the buildings. Are the modules going to be in the way of the addition? Or are we, have, or are we putting this in such a way <coughs> that they're not in conflict with one another? They would not be in conflict with you. The, there would, the modules are going to be in the, the side parking lot. The addition, should that be where we move, and frankly, that is my recommendation, is that um, we consider adding an addition onto Thompson. The, the building was designed that you could add on. It's the classroom wing. It'd be extending the classroom wing um, out. OK, are there other questions? Stephen. Yeah, uh, and what's the period of the, um, of the lease? If, if we take out $200,000 from the reserve fund, is that covering a year? Is it covering I just? I believe a minute. Uh, I don't want you to answer that. <coughs> Thank you. So from what you've seen from the Stratton uh, uh, bids, there's a fixed fee up front uh, for, for beginning the lease period, and then there's lease payments on a monthly basis going forward. So what we presume we'd be asking for is that fixed fee up front to order these modules, have them fabricated, and possibly even delivered before the end of the fiscal year. And then we would budget lease payments in FY17 and beyond. Okay. All right. So it just covers the period to the end of the fiscal year. For yeah. Perfect. Thank you. OK, Alan? I just, just like to have on the table another factor that's pushing off um, Discussions about permanent uh, reconfigurations with additions and whatever is that the disposition of the Newgar site is still uncertain, and that could again change the, the, the population, which we might know in a year or two. Uh, as so it balances between, say, Thompson and Hardy, you know, where, where the new students are, are going to show up, that could be impacted by the ultimate disposition of the Newgar site. It's just another ball in the air that emphasizes, you know, why, why do something temporary. Sure. Since the uh, subject of the Mueller property is on the table, <laughs> um, I would like to mention that I have suggested to the Board of Selectmen and, and other parties in town that um, if the Mugar site is going to be developed, we should be, the town should somehow be um, negotiating with Mugar to, to get some additional benefit from them. You know, and I, I don't know what we have to give up or how we get there, but, but um, you know, some, some use of that space and perhaps a community center or something like that that could, could uh, uh, take care of the people that are using the, the Gibbs. Uh, I don't know. There's, there's probably somewhere there's a, a, something that could contribute to this whole uh, situation of, of enrollment pressure. OK, are there any other questions? John? Uh, maybe there's a question that's sort of off the wall, but you, you know the, the whole business of school population is very uncertain. There's a very large standard deviation, we call that, or variation year to year and uh, decade to decade as to how many students we might have in, in any district. I'm just looking here for the, the thing that uh, Dean handed out in the, the that uh, the uh, Thompson is re really a huge surprise. I mean, I, the, the student uh, version two goes out to 500 students way out in, the, in 2021. <coughs> if there's any use, useful thought been given to the possibility of simply buying modules and keeping them on hand rather than renting, uh, so that we can move them around if we have to. Does that make any sense to anybody? I mean, it, it, it occurred to me just looking at this sheet that, uh, that Dean handed out that there is such fluctuation that maybe it's a useful thing to, to buy modules and keep them in good shape and uh, just move them from place to place if we need to. Is that a sensible thing, thought, or is it just a silly thing to think about anything like that? No, I'm just looking at manager can probably speak to this because he's looked at the bids, but a lot of the costs of modular classrooms are actually the setup or the siting of I'm them. Sorry, 
It doesn't amplify. It's not amplifying. I think it's for probably ACMI. Um, I'll talk louder. Most of, uh, I, I, I shouldn't say most, but a, a large part of the cost of modular classrooms is the siting of them. and Because uh, they, they bring them in prefabricated and, and site them there, so it's setting up the foundations and hooking up the plumbing, electricity, all of that. So having done this years ago, in an, uh, another district, I can tell you that we found that there wasn't a lot of savings um, moving around. Now, having said that, Belmont is doing something like that. They're moving them around, and uh, that might that might work. You can you can purchase modular classrooms, and in fact, I just recently learned of a place in Georgia where you can buy one for two hundred thousand. The price may be going up as everybody wants to buy them now, but. Uh, you could buy them, and then, and then, but there's going to be always a cost with citing them on a, a new, a new situation, new place. Thank you, Adam. Do you have anything to add to that? I would second uh, what the superintendent said that there's definitely a significant site cost that goes along with it. But I think it is reasonable for us to do some further due diligence before we actually decide whether or not to lease or buy. So it's, it's not so it's sensitive. OK, so if you could, uh, when you come back with the reserve fund transfer request, I think that would be a good thing to see. It's almost like every elementary school should be built with uh, the, the, a pad and, uh, and the water and sewer and electric hookups all installed so they could, they could be like campgrounds where you bring the modulars from school to school. But it's too late now to add that to all the schools. So. Okay, are there any other questions on Article 4? Okay, do I have a motion? Okay, it's been moved and seconded for Article 4 uh, with a vote requesting town meeting support. Uh, is there any other discussion? Dean? So I handed this chart on. What I did here was the last meeting we had, I had given you the 2010 2015 enrollment reports and then the superintendent's analysis of available space. What I did here, because I think we got flooded with a bunch of, of enrollment task force information is I, I took the same, I took the enrollment numbers for the McKibben report, which for 2010, 11, 15, and 16, is projection one, is projection two. And then I layered in what I did in my own mind of the one man kingdom concluded were the classrooms for each grade in each school based on the monthly enrollment reports that the district <coughs> issues. And, and the reason I did that is I felt like when you put it all on one page, it, it captured the issue in, in what we're looking at, right? So if you go to the back and you look at the Thompson, you see a 335 student school that has become a 425 student school. Um, along the way, you know, you, we were using 15 classrooms, we're using 19 classrooms. The big thing I point out here, there are two things I'd point out. The 2010-11 kindergarten is the 2015-16 fifth grade. It's why I use those, those two years. Um, if you look at the grade, grade five, and I think I said this the last meeting, um, we, we have this horribly embarrassing classroom of 30 kids, right? Which I think as, um, as residents of the town, we should you know, not, not be too proud about, right? And I think some of that's driven by funding, but I also think it is, it, it is driven by just having nowhere to put these kids, right? So when we look at the Thompson, I, I know we talked them about them having no available space. I mean, you could also say that they're minus one at the moment, which is how I like to look at it because we had to squeeze the fifth grade together. Um, beyond that, I think the other thing that we, we also need to sort of think about is a, a school built for 335 kids or 380 kids was built with a gym for 380 kids, was built with a cafeteria for 380 kids, was built for other common spaces for 380 kids. And if these were, you know, as you simply look at it, as these, in, you know, in 15 and 16, it becomes, it becomes pretty clear that what happened is the cohorts are coming in at 80, right? And they're replacing cohorts of between 50 and 60. And so we know this is going to, you have to assume if it's happened the last one, two, three, four years, and you look at the birth numbers in East Arlington, that's likely to continue ripping her off, right? And we can say to ourselves, look, realistically, there's probably no difference between having um, 74 kids show up and 88 kids show up, right? Because I think under both scenarios, you put four of them in four classrooms, okay? 
Um, but still, that's a big number compared to a school that used to bring in kids about, about 50 in a, in a class. And so I think, and that was why I had, I had sort of set Adam up with that question, was just, just to point out that, you know, we had the two modulus this year, fine, it's Springtown meeting. We fixed next year's cohort of 80 that's going to show up. But we still, when the fourth grade leaves the following year, have another problem. We have another cohort of 80 that's going to show up. So we're going to go even, theoretically, even in the, in the classroom spaces. We're probably squeezed out in the court in the common spaces. The following year, we have this problem all over again, right? And so if you go to the front page, I'll go to the front page where the heart is, and I should have put them on the same page. You, you, and you look at 2010-11, and you look at 15-16, you see the exact same problem. Right, except it's on a lag. It looks like Thompson's like a year ahead of the Hardy in terms of this wave of students coming through, right? And so while all the attention focuses on the, the Thompson, right, the, the Hardy's gonna have the same problem the following year. I'm making that up or you're, good. So, so the Hardy has this problem, just rolling right behind, right? And, and I bring this up, not because I wanna, you know, start, you know, propose something different or, or go against the enrollment task force. But I, I just want to point out to the, the, the members of this committee that regardless of what we do, right, I think we have to come to the conclusion that it's going to cost a bunch of money, right? We're, we're going to be digging deep for this one. Um, but what I'm concerned about is, is two things. One, not coming up with a, a comprehensive solution, right? And, and what I mean by that is the school committee had taken a vote um, to support the addition of, of five permanent classrooms at Thompson, which, which if you look at my thing, looks like, looks like a good idea, right? And then um, at the Enrollment Task Force, the chair of the Finance Committee and the chair of the Capital Planning Committee proposed making the Hardy and um, Thompson sort of one district, right? Which one member of the school committee just did, didn't like the fact that they were imposing on school committee policy and it was sort of a, a non-committal thing. Now, I'm not saying the school committee should do that, but, but what, I'm, what I'm trying to get at is voting to put five classrooms on the Thompson didn't fix the problem that's right behind the Thompson, which is the Hardy, right? And, and at the same time, and I had another hint that I didn't hand out, the problem is, is just all these kids, right? You get these cohorts of 80 coming in here, there, and everywhere. They start pushing up. Right, and they're gonna push right into the middle school. Right, and we're gonna take this middle school from 1,100 kids to 14, 1,500 kids, and we, we can barely fit them using the current, whatever heck that fan, fancy term is for how we do middle schools that don't look, high, look like high schools or whatever. But we're sort of on edge for the educational model we use at the middle school, and so pretty soon we're gonna have to get to the point of adding a whole bunch of modulars in 18, 17? 17, so now we're gonna have to put a whole bunch of modulars there, right, if we do nothing. Oh, well, the minimum we're going to have to do is put a whole bunch of modulars there. Um, and so the, the concern I have, and the reason I'm going to, I brought it up last time, the reason I brought it up this time, the reason I'm going to keep bringing it up until you guys hate me, and well, you probably already hate me, but hate me even more than you might already, is um, we, we have to, we not only have to fix this, and we not, but we have to find it in a way that fixes it all, right? And, and that's what kind of concerns me, is we, we hear a lot of solutions from a lot of the different groups I picked on the school committee to fix one element of it. But we gotta fix it once, right? Because the worst thing you can do, and this is why I've sort of become comfortable with just the two modules, the worst thing you can do is keep building, right? And it becomes more and more expensive, right? And so you have to do this. And so I, I think that becomes, as, as a finance committee, right? The people that ultimately have to defend these votes and recommend these votes and, and, and get beat on and things like that is, you know, we have to, though we're not, though we sort of, given up some of our own, you know, statutory authority to the enrollment task force, which makes which sense. But we also, I think, have to keep our own watchful eye that, you know, that we have to make sure there's a balance here, right? That we watch out for the taxpayers so they're not getting stuck with this large bill for some reckless solution, right, on one hand. But on the other hand, we also have to stay vigilant in the sense that we can't, um, we can't come up with an answer that's just like wild and crazy and wacky and creates a bad educational environment um, for our children. And so, you know, that's why I, I just wanted to bring this up. I wanted to point it out. Um, and, and just so we didn't get to a point where we sort of, you know, proposed it, said two modules, great idea, thumbs up, all's well here. 
and then we end up six months, year down the road saying, oh God, this isn't all well, we have a bigger problem. So that, that's all I got for now. Okay, thank you, Dean. This will be a continuing process. Uh, Charlie. Yeah, I just want to make a couple of comments on Dean's observations. I think, uh, thank you very much for putting together this uh, sheet of uh, student population. Um, but, you know, I don't think, I don't think it's fair to characterize the uh, enrollment task force as, as uh, not trying to address the, uh, the total problem. Um, but part of, the, part of the issue is that the total problem is not known. And um, committing large sums of money towards unknowns is not necessarily the, the best thing that we could be doing. When we have some very serious knowns uh, visible on the horizon, and, and those, you know, the, I, I think the middle school problem is, is a much larger problem than the, uh, than the Thompson problem. And that's, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know what the school department or the town management is going to propose to address that problem, but it's, it's, it's pretty significant and it's not too far away. We can see it, okay? The, the, as, uh, as Al mentioned earlier, the, the initial population forecast made by the consultant turned out to be uh, overstated. And, and uh, the question is, is next year, are they, are they also going to be overstated? I mean, I think, I think we have to see, see how that, that uh, system turns out. Um, I also <coughs> would like to note that, which, which I noted at the enrollment task force, that there, there is a, an available capacity after the Stratton is completed, there's an available capacity in the town of somewhere between six and 11 classrooms that could be applied to the issue of reducing the enrollment pressure. And there's a strong sentiment uh, uh, on the school department, uh, a part of the school committee that uh, we should be sticking with this concept of neighborhood schools. And I don't think anybody on the enrollment task force is proposing to bus kids from one end of the town to the other. But in fact, today, you know, we are busing children in uh, the Bishop District a distance that's equal to the distance from East Arlington to Lexington. Um, and and um, those kids seem to think they're in a neighborhood school. So, um, you know, the, the suggestion that, I'm, uh, that uh, Mr. Tosti made, and I made as well at the, uh, you know Mr. Tosti, right? <laughs> um, it made at the uh, enrollment task force was that um, there, there are potentially uh, what we call administrative solutions to this, um, to take some of the enrollment pressure off, which could mitigate some of the situation, could, I emphasize could, it's not clear, some of the situation uh, in East Arlington. Uh, one of them is that uh, something that, uh, I don't know whether you mentioned it, Dean, or, or Al mentioned it, but the, the idea of treating Bishop and Hardy as a combined district, uh, to, to give some flexibility there. But the other suggestion, another suggestion that was made is to, um, to do some redistricting throughout the whole town. And not necessarily huge changes in the geographic distribution, but if you look at the a map of all of the school districts, if, they, if those districts got rotated five or 10 degrees in a westerly direction, we would be redistributing students a little bit further into the area of town where in other words, at the, at the borders, where, where, the, where the additional capacity is, and taking some of the pressure off uh, the Thompson and the Hardy. And, and um, it's, you know, there clearly are political implica implications to that, there are academic implications, et cetera, but th I think these things need to be addressed uh, by the school department in, in, um, in trade-offs made between uh, what, what permanent solutions will cost and what a, a, a conditioning solution might, might cost. So, uh, and I'm not saying that I have the answers, but I just think that they have to be addressed. And I, and I will say that Dr. Bodie presented to the enrollment task force a couple of scenarios with these readjustments, and it was clear that there's a way to get some additional um, utilized capacity by doing something like this. Um, and, I, and I hope that the uh, school committee and the school department uh, investigates this subject further in the future. Okay, as they have promised to do. Um, is there any other discussion on Article 4? 
Oh, Stephen, I can't help myself after the comment from John and Dean and, and just hearing about parity. And, and, and it's a terrible problem looking forward with, when you only have two schools east of Pleasant Street and, and you've got growing numbers at the Hardy, I'll say this for the Hardy School, because it was a renovation, there's several classrooms at the Hardy that are well below the standard classroom size that you would see for a new school. So, so the ability for Hardy to absorb more students is much less than what it would be at, at, at other schools. So when you start talking about numbers getting getting up higher, you get some classrooms that are that are 525 square feet, which is way below um, what numbers should be. So I, I I know there'll be a thoughtful analysis of some real hard decisions, um, but but the need for modulars or, or something to keep parity if we're really going to keep neighborhood schools if that's if that's a priority. Um, we're going to have to make some tough decisions. Or schools are going to have to make some tough decisions. We're going to have to vote on some tough decisions. But it's, it's not, not every building is equal in terms of what they can absorb either. Well, there'll be a lot coming down the line, including how do we afford Minuteman uh, if that project goes to fruition. And of course, the high school, uh, the board of, uh, board of the Mass School Building Authority is going to be voting on that, uh, uh, I think, next week. And uh, so that'll be a, another project on our, on our plate. So there's, there's plenty there. Any further discussion on Article 4? Okay, all those in uh, motion has been made and seconded for favorable action on our recommendation. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, unanimous. Okay, Article 5 has been voted, collective bargaining. Article 6. Uh, has been voted for no action under this article. I, I'd like to re-vote Article 7 for two reasons. We just voted no action. Um, this is going to be a selectman's vote, so they're going to be the main uh, promoter of this. So I'd like to change our vote to the Finance Committee supports the no action vote of the Board of Selectmen. Uh, and I'd like to vote a second time again because if you remember correctly, our last vote was 17 to 1. And when I talked to the individual who voted against it on the way out the door, uh, he said that after, after that vote he realized he made a mistake and he was not thinking about exactly, sometimes these wordings get a little awkward. Uh, and so now he supports a favorable action. So rather than have somebody get up on front of town meeting and ask why there was one no vote and somebody has to get up and explain how he made a mistake, I think it'd be easier if we just re-voted it um, to uh, the same vote but the, uh, a new vote so we can get a unanimous vote. Uh, so if we're going to do that, again, it's the same vote, no action, but we're just supporting the selectmen. Uh, we'd have to, Sony move reconsideration, we vote that. And then we vote favorable action on the uh, finance committee supports the no action vote of the salt. Move reconsideration. Second. Okay, uh, John. Okay, just a question. You already voted on no action on Article Six. Yes. Because it's underlined here. And I, I know it is, and then Peter corrected my mistake. Uh, I guess that we had voted no action in that article already. Uh, so Peter is our keeper of the record, so I always trust him. Uh, okay, motion's been made and seconded to reconsider. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> okay. Uh, do I have a uh, uh, favorable vote on the vote as underlined? So moved. moved. Second. Second. Okay. Uh, any, any questions? Same exact thing, we're just changing the wording and revoting. All those in favor of the vote as underlined, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, Article 8 has already been voted as, uh, as stated. Uh, so that is the, uh, the report. Uh, I'm going to go home, make a couple of the, remove the underlines and things like that. I'll email that to, uh, to Gloria and to the Selectman's office. Uh, Gloria will go down uh, risking life, limb, and paper cuts. <laughs> Uh, and help stuff and get these out with the selectman's report and the capital budget report has to go to the selectman's office nine o'clock tomorrow too. Uh, and that'll be in the mail. I will email a copy to Alan who will PDF it and send it out to the town meeting 
uh, members, so probably, somebody told me 80% of the town meeting members are on the list, so 80% of the town meeting members will have the report tomorrow. Uh, I'm assuming the selectmen will do the same thing. Uh, I'd like to re uh, sorry, Paul? Uh, just, is there anything new about Minute, Minuteman? Uh, yeah, I guess we have this thing about the Lexington vote. Um, uh, Wayland, has, has any uh, town meeting voted on the regional agreement? I have not heard. I'm sorry. We are first. We are first. I always love to be first. Mm -hmm. uh, I got conned into, uh, no, nah, that's a strong word. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm taking uh, sous chef or to the uh, breakfast meeting at Minuteman tomorrow, so I'll, <laughs> I'll keep my ears open and see uh, if I hear anything. I intend to keep my mouth shut. Uh, okay, I'd like to remind everybody that uh, Monday will be the special town meeting. Uh, with any luck, we can get through this fairly quickly. Um, we will have a finance committee meeting at 7.30 in this room uh, on, Monday on Monday night uh, in case there's any last minute crisis. Hopefully there will not be. So I ask everybody to be here right at 7.30 uh, for that. Now, uh, there's, if, the, if it goes to Wednesday, then we'll have another meeting at 7.30 on Wednesday night. Hopefully it will go uh, in one night. Uh, the first meeting of, uh, the next meeting of the Finance Committee after that will be February 1st. Uh, that will be the beginning of our regular preparation for the annual town meeting. Uh, you all have your budgets, um, either hard copy or, actually you got both now. Uh, and so I ask you to start meeting with your subcommittees and meeting with the uh, department heads and please uh, get, those to get those done as soon as possible. Um, Gloria, have you seen any of the warrant yet? When does the warrant close? 31st, so that'll be uh, 29th, so it'll be next Friday, a week from Friday. Okay, so if you could try to get that as soon as possible, <coughs> and could you start calling and uh, hear, setting up hearings for the usual cast of characters uh, and get that need. Um, I need budget, you know, I need uh, recommendations for uh, your departments. If you can get one done, get that done. Um, and uh, so I don't have to cancel too many meetings uh, in order to get this done. My goal is to have the Finance Committee report recommendations done by the end of March. Uh, and just to let you know ahead of time, there will be no meetings uh, the first week in April, in case anybody wants to go anywhere. Uh, yeah. Um, and that's it. Is there any other business? Okay, I'd like to just for a second talk with Charlie, Dick, and Dean uh, for a second after this meeting. If there's no other business, uh, meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much.